All right, I wanna dive into part two of our perturbation theory discussion, having kind of gotten a sense of how the whole theory works uh, with lecture number one. Um, so to start off here, I'm gonna show you the standing wave patterns um, in an open tube in a slightly different format. Um, if you remember from the last lecture, we looked at those diagrams that were based on Chiba and Kajiyama's originally di original diagrams from 1941, and they showed you kind of where the um, antinodes for velocity were in the vocal tract, but uh, not a lot else. So what I'm going to do here, or what I have done, uh, is that <clears throat> I've plotted out the two different relevant standing wave patterns, one for F1 in red and one for F2 in blue. Um, on an Excel graph, which is a bit ad hoc, but is still um, kind of relevant to the discussion. Um, so the idea is on the x-axis here, I'm plotting distance from the glottis. So here's our loudspeaker or vibrating glottis end. And then we have our lips over here. Uh, and this is for a speaker with a vocal tract length of approximately 17 and a half centimeters, which is approximately uh, well, this is exactly 17 and a half centimeters, but it's approximately the length of my vocal tract um, from which we've seen um, we get kind of a basic value of 500 hertz for F1 and 1500 hertz for F2. And we want to be able to tweak those values around depending on uh, based on how we sort of perturb the vocal tract or constrict the vocal tract at various spots on this continuum um, on the horizontal axis. So the theory says that the vocal tract resonances or the formants that we get are the result of these standing waves in the vocal tract and this red one is what produces the first formant f1 and the blue one is what produces the second formant f2 and i'm plotting velocity here so this is a velocity node these are velocity antinodes and then we get another node and antinode here in the middle for f2 yeah so there, where velocity alternates between high and low is where we're getting these antinodes. We always have an antinode for velocity at the lips. In areas where velocity does not change, the nodes are, um, there's always a node at the glottis, no matter what standing wave you're dealing with. All right, that's kind of the foundation of the resonance framework. The way perturbation theory works, or it bases its predictions on what effects constrictions made in the vocal tract um, along the length of the vocal tract have on particular formant frequencies. And its first principle is that if you constrict at an antinode, like at the lips, then you're going to decrease um, that resonant frequency. So both F1 and F2 have antinodes at the lips. If you constrict at the lips rather than just, oh, oh, you know, you get, you lower those formant frequencies, both F1 and F2, because they both have an antinode there. If you constrict um, at or near this other antinode for F2 in the pharyngeal region, about five or six centimeters away from the glottis, that will also decrease F2, but not so much F1, because you're kind of in the halfway spot here for F1. Um, yeah, also the flip side of that is that if you constrict at a velocity node, like at the glottis or at the palate for uh, F2, then that's going to raise your resonant or formant frequency. So constricting at the glottis should raise both F1 and F2, just like an A ah or a vowel similar to that. Uh, and then you can also raise F2 um, if you constrict at the palate, <coughs> palate like for E. Um, yeah, and that's basically how it works. This, these diagrams are constructed to basically give you a better sense of where exactly in the vocal tract these constrictions are being made or where these nodes and antinodes can be found. Um, so I wanna kind of roughly sketch out where these antinodes and nodes are. Um, and the way I've kind of divvied this up is I've uh, plotted dashed lines on the diagram where one or the other uh, resonant frequency or one or the other standing wave pattern crosses from being closer to node or closer to anti-node. And that's kind of at this halfway point um, in the y-axis, either above or below um, the zero line. So this front region of the vocal tract from about 13 or 14 centimeters forward, so basically the first inch um, 
or a little bit more inside your mouth. I'm labeling as the lab, lab, labeling as the labial region, uh, although it might include, say, dental consonants as well, or something a little bit further back. And that's where we get anti-nodes for both form and frequencies. So you can strict there, then both those form and frequencies are going to go down, right? Move a little bit further back, and F2 gets into more of a nodal region um, between about nine and 13 centimeters from the glottis. Uh, and I'm gonna label that as the palatal region. Um, so if you constrict there, we have a node for F2 and an anti-node for F1. So a constriction there should raise uh, F2, but it should decrease F1 because we're still relatively close to this <coughs> anti-node at the front of the vocal tract, sorry. My voice doesn't want to work today. <clears throat> That's what I get for recording in the afternoon rather than um, at night. Anyways, uh, so if we constrict here, we get the pattern, we should get the pattern that we expect for E with a lower F1 and a higher F2, and that is why, because of this, um, these two standing wave patterns in that region. If we go a little bit further back, I'm gonna label this as the velar region, because here is where F2 goes back up above the halfway point in terms of being a node and an anti-node. It's more anti-node-y here, uh, while for F1, we're still relatively a little bit above the line, so this is more anti-node than node. And what that means is that we're closer to anti-nodes for both waves again. Um, and if we constrict there, we should see um, the same effect as we get for constricting at the labial or at the lips region. Uh, so F1 should go down more or less and F2 should go down as well. So this is kind of nice because we have kind of a connection here between the velar regions and uh, between the velar and uh, labial regions. They should give us both the same acoustic effects, constrictions in those regions, that is. Uh, if we move further back, then finally we get to the point where F1 becomes closer to a node than a node. For a while, F2 is closer to an anti-node. So we'll call this the pharyngeal region, which is nice because uh, this is where we can produce a vowel like ah. So we're closer to an anti-node for F2. We're closer to a node for F1. That means if we constrict there, then F1 should increase because we're closer to a node. And then F2 should decrease like a constriction we get uh, in the velar or labial regions, right? Uh, and if we do this, F1 goes up, F2 goes down. They kind of come close to each other. That's the pattern we get, the acoustic pattern we see for formants uh, of the vowel ah. And then lastly, all the way back to the larynx, we're close to a node or basically at a node for both of those guys. Um, and if we constrict there, that should raise both form and frequencies for that reason, region, ah, for that reason, in that region. Okay, we'll make it through this. Um, anyways, so we kind of have five different options to choose from here. And interestingly enough, some of them can work together like the labial region and the velar region both have the same effects more or less. Uh, like I said, though, you kind of would expect um, the acoustic effects of these articulations to be uh, more profound the closer you get to a node or an anti-node. So these kind of intermediate regions will give you kind of intermediate effects, basically. At least that's the expectation based on the theory. <clears throat> All right, we are going to try to figure out how this works or make predictions um, based on this theory for a completely different setup uh, than we normally see for a human vocal tract. So we can't obviously open up a human vocal tract when it's in action. We could maybe look at it with like MRI or something like that um, if we wanted to. Uh, we're not going to do that. Instead, what we're going to do uh, is create a system which should have, physically speaking, the same sort of um, resonating properties as a human vocal tract. But we're going to give it a different source and we're going to construct the resonating material out of something entirely different than a human being. <clears throat> so I've got a couple of videos here for you and I have a feeling YouTube is going to put a copyright claim on them. Uh, YouTube's amazing that it can figure out that certain portions of your video uh, have a copyright claim on them, but they don't tell you which portions those are right away. It could be easy to fix if they did. So you're amazing, but not amazing enough YouTube. Um, so what I'm going to play is an old commercial from a little over 10 years ago involving Peter Frampton uh, using what's called the talk box. So uh, 
you have almost certainly in your life heard a talk box before. Um, I didn't even know what one was until uh, for a while when I was in grad school. I played music with some grad school friends uh, who were much more talented and much more inclined to play the guitar than I was. Uh, and so they got one of these devices and played around with it for a while. So the way a talk box works, um, so first of all, I guess I'll explain, um, since we'll talk about music a little bit next time too. Um, so the way a normal guitar works is that the sort of source of the sound of a guitar is, um, is or are the vibrating strings that you can pluck, right? And then the resonator or the filter for that sound is the body of the guitar itself. The whole thing vibrates in response uh, to particular uh, frequencies that it likes to kind of give it that particular uh, guitar sound. So you could, you know, you could play the exact same <clears throat> note, uh, which is a particular frequency or pitch on a violin versus a guitar. Um, and so kind of the frequency source of those two sounds be more or less the same. You, you voice it in a different fashion, right? So you bow a string on a um, violin, so it kind of has a smooth sound or should have a more or less smooth sound all the way. Uh, in, on a guitar, you normally will pluck a string to create that sound, so that onset will be a little bit different. You can pluck a string on a violin too, of course, uh, but they will sound different. A violin sounds different from a guitar, um, even if the frequencies that the two instruments are playing are the same because the, um, the resonating bodies of the two instruments are different, right? Um, so the trick is uh, when you play an electric guitar, you are not relying on the body of the guitar for amplification. Um, and in fact, normally when you play the strings on an electric guitar, it's hard to make them sound very loud at all. Uh, so what happens with an electric guitar is the whole system is hooked up to uh, an electric circuit basically that you can feed into an amplifier. Uh, and then when you um, kind of displace the strings, uh, it displaces the strings within a magnetic field, um, which are created by these things called the pickups, uh, which we don't really need to get into, but basically the source sound um, gets immediately translated into some sort of electrical circuit, which you can plug into an amplifier and then make it sound louder. Uh, and then the interesting thing is with an electric guitar is that in between sort of the sourcing of the sound as it were, and the amplification of the sound, you could put in all sorts of different effects to sort of shape um, or filter the uh, output of the sound rather than just intensifying it uh, per se. And so what you can do is plug your guitar into this box or this device called a talk box. And this was popular in the 70s and to a certain extent in the 80s. Not as much anymore, but it's still kind of fun. So you plug the output of your guitar, basically the notes these strings are playing on the guitar into this talk box, uh, which will amplify it. But then the output of the talk box goes into this plastic tube, which you can stick into your mouth. Uh, and then while you are kind of sucking on this tube and playing your guitar, you shape your mouth without speaking you just shape your mouth to be a resonator for the sound coming out of the tube. And then after the tube, so the tube gives you the source frequencies played by the guitar strings, you shape and amplify and intensify that sound or those sounds with the shape of your mouth. And then you're speaking very closely or shaping your mouth very closely to a microphone, which actually does the amplification of those sounds. Uh, by itself. So the long and short of it is that you will be sounding like a uh, talking guitar, basically, uh, without you actually talking. The guitar strings are uh, taking the place of your vocal folds. Um, I'm also going to show you another device called the Sonovox. After having given you that long description of what a talk box does, I'm going to play this commercial which demonstrates it. And I have a feeling uh, this commercial might not make it through onto you, uh, YouTube, but we'll see if it does. So the um, most famous practitioner of the talk box is probably this guy, Peter Frampton. Uh, and if you have ever listened to a classic rock station, you have heard uh, the music he's played. Um, and maybe, I don't know, your parents listen to him. Or maybe he's too old for your parents, I don't know. Either way, he's very, very good at this. Uh, and this is kind of a jokey commercial about how good he is at the instrument. Mr. Merton, not a paid celebrity. So to help tell her story. Hold on. Gotta start from zero. Kari Rigg is a real Geico customer, not a paid celebrity. So to help tell her story, we hired Peter Frampton. My car was totally smashed in an accident. 
Not a great way to start the morning. And the tow truck that the police called damaged it even more. I wanted to pull my hair out. Geico handled everything quick and easy. It felt great. Do you feel like I do? Geico. Real service, real savings. All right. Very cool. Or maybe, um, maybe a little bit dorky. But either way, it's neat the way this works. So the guy has, or Peter Frampton, I shouldn't just call him the guy. Uh, he's a lot more famous than me. All right, so he's hooked up his guitar into the talk box, and you can see this tube coming out, uh, kind of wrapped around the microphone stand. So uh, basically it projects here a little bit, and when he um, uh, wants to sort of play the guitar slash speak, he has to wrap his mouth around the tube um, as well as kind of getting in front of the microphone. My co-customer, not a paid celebrity. So to help so tell her story, we hired there. Peter Frampton. My car was totally smashed in an accident. Not a great way to start the morning. And so when he's playing the guitar through his mouth into the microphone, it's these huge amps which actually amplify the sound. Um, so yeah, like I said, uh, some friends of mine introduced me to this device um, and uh, it was fun to try to play around with. Um, I think they would play the guitar and then I would just try to like mouth the sounds uh, because I can't really play the guitar. Uh, and um, the thing that was hardest to do was anything involving back places of articulation or backer places of articulation. So the fact that he can produce reasonable Ks and Gs with this thing is just kind of amazing. For most people, I think it would just be like a wow, wow, wow kind of sound. The tow truck that the police call damaged it even more. I wanted to pull my hair out. Those are fun. Geico handled everything places. quick and easy. It felt great. Do you feel like I do? Geico. Real service. Re and so somehow he got that K in there. And do you feel like I do? Uh, but you got to get the tube pretty far back there to let uh, that stop place of articula articulation work in front of it. Um, this is another video which I think comes from the Disney Corporation, so I'm almost certain that they will prevent me from presenting it to you on YouTube. Uh, but we'll see. Uh, so this is a video that a student of mine um, pointed me in the direction of. Uh, it's from the 40s, so it's a little bit old-fashioned. Um, I think we can survive it, though. Um, and um, it shows you how a device called the Sonovox works, which is basically an artificial larynx. So um, that there are certain cases in life where people lose their larynxes, uh, say if they have cancer of the larynx, which uh, can sometimes be a side effect of smoking too much. Uh, that can be removed. And I talked a little bit uh, a while back about how you could potentially produce something like esophageal voice to uh, have a voice even without a larynx. Um, not easy to do, but it's possible. Uh, Another way you can get around the problem of not having vocal folds is to use an artificial larynx, which is basically a device which vibrates, which you can put around your neck, uh, and that will provide sort of the source sound for you. Uh, and then you can still shape your vocal track to produce the relevant sounds on top of that. Uh, so let's see if we can get this to work. We've improved the looks of them since I was a boy. What goes on around here? We're making the sound for a cartoon train. Look, I'll show you. All aboard! All aboard! Clear the track! Here I go! <laughs> well, does that come natural, or is that something you picked up in high school? <laughs> well, anybody can do it. The train sounds are all on here. You hold these over your vocal cords and move your lips, like this. Don't you want to try it? I don't it? know. I wouldn't know what to say. Don't say anything. Only don't really talk. Just make believe. Oh, I'm tickled now. What do I say? Friends, Romans, countrymen? Anything. Friends, Romans, See how easy it is? Pardon me, Mr. Bensley. This is your score, Doris. I've got all the cues marked in, I think. Yeah, so <clears throat> the point of both of these demonstrations or examples is that you can change the source of sound, uh, but use the same filter as you use in speech to get something that sounds like speech. 
Uh, and what I want to do in these sort of um, mind experiments for figuring out how perturbation theory works is to um, replace the normal uh, source of speech sounds with a duck call. Uh, and this is a demo I got online a long time ago. Uh, usually this is pretty loud, but hopefully not too loud. Yeah, so that is what our voicing source is going to be for this demo. Kind of sounds like it's in the vicinity of normal human F0. But what we're going to do is put that duck call in front of a tube that is open at one end. So this is these are tubes that are uh, kind of custom made to have particular shapes um, to make the output of this system sound fairly similar to human vowels. Um, and so I got this from this site a long time ago. I would I kind of doubt if it's still up. I didn't check before I posted this lecture, but um, this is where the duck call is placed. So this is kind of the loudspeaker end of the whole system. Unfortunately, it's oriented the opposite way from the way we normally look at this. Uh, and then this is the vocal tract. So you can see here that the vocal tract is uh, kind of constricted and perturbed in particular places. Uh, and that should be enough to give you a clue as to what vowels are being produced by these two systems. So I have the duck call here, and this is the far back of my vocal tract. Uh, you can kind of think of this kind of constricted area here as like where you'd find the epiglottis, sort of the first, first inch away from the vocal folds and also maybe the, the false ventricular folds. But here, the major constriction is up in front, right? So if we constrict here, closer to the front of the mouth and we have a fairly narrow constriction, then what vowel should that produce? You can kind of think of this, you might want to go back to those uh, diagrams I just showed you with the different standing waves on it. Uh, so we're not totally at the front of the mouth or maybe a region right behind it, right? So this is maybe the palatal region perhaps. And if we constrict at the palatal region, we've got a node for F2 and an anti-node sort of for F1. So F2 should go down, or sorry, F2 should go up, F1 should go down, we should get something that sounds like an E, right? This is like making that high front articulation with your tongue, E. Oh, come on. Um, yeah, so how about this one? In this particular system, uh, looks like things are pretty open here in the front, especially open here in the palatal region. And we still have the kind of same setup in the back. Maybe it's a little bit narrower, uh, but we have a constriction kind of right in front of that. Not so much at the laryngeal or glottal region, but maybe the next step up. Where's that? Maybe in the pharynx region. And that's where we normally find a um, anti-node for F2. And we're closer to a node for F1, right? So that should push F1 up, push F2 down, and we should get a vowel, it sounds like. Something like ah. This one sounds a little bit rounded. But yeah, I think I'll turn that up a bit uh, and play both of them again. Right, E and ah. Uh, so these are kind of on opposite ends of the vowel space from each other. That's why we have a narrow constriction here and a kind of wide opening here. And this is wide open here and kind of tightly constricted down at the bottom. Yeah, but all that's happening here is that we're making constrictions at sort of the relevant spots um, in the vocal tract filter. Uh, so this kind of shows you how the vocal tract matches up with the tube shape that has been created by the amazing people who put this together. Uh, and so you can kind of see how it's a little bit more open here in the front for ah, and then tightly constricted in the back and vice versa over here. Uh, yeah, these are what the spectrograms look like. The E one is more convincing. <laughs> Uh, you can see this low F1 and the higher F2 around 2100 hertz or so. Um, you should see normally uh, for ah, a high F1 and a low F2. They might be kind of merged with each other. They might be a little bit split. Uh, this one looks like kind of irregular voicing, so it's hard to kind of get a consistent read on the formants in the middle, but they're in the right spot, more or less. <laughs> um, and then I've got some spectra here. Yeah, so these are the spectra. I don't normally spend too much time on these in class, but we might as well, right? So uh, here's your F1 for E. Um, and then we kind of, yeah, I think this is F2 and this is probably F3. Um, but they're split here. 
Um, this is F1 for the ah, and this is F2 for the ah. They're really close to each other. There's only kind of one harmonic in between them that's kind of doesn't dip down as much as you might expect it to. So you're kind of getting sort of one broad form in here for the ah, uh, whereas you expect them to be split more uh, for the E. Okay, how about these? Um, these will look kind of similar to the previous examples, but not exactly the same. We've got the duck call over here. In this one, we've got a constriction in a backer place of articulation, maybe not all the way in the pharynx. Uh, and then you might notice we have a constriction here at the front, uh, which is where you normally expect to find the lips. So if we have a labial constriction and kind of a backer constriction, what vowel might that be? You can even think of it in terms of high back if you want, um, or you can think about it in terms of what we find here for standing waves. So at the lips, we have anti-nodes for F1 and F2. So this should lower both formant frequencies. This is maybe a bit further forward than the pharynx. So this is what this should give us also uh, anti-nodes for F1 and F2. And a constriction here should sort, of, uh, should sort of reinforce what we are doing with our lips and give us two low formant frequencies or the vowel. <laughs> It's supposed to be ooh. <laughs> it may sound a little bit more like oh. Uh, and in fact, it kind of is so constricted, I think it's producing a bit of turbulence as the air goes through the tube. Um, so you get kind of a buffeting wind effect there. Uh, but it's supposed to be ooh. <laughs> this one is more wide open than other vowels we've seen so far. This is basically the same. Where we're getting kind of a constriction here is up in the front again. So before we saw a nice tight constriction for E in the palatal region. Here we're not constricting as much, so we shouldn't quite get um, the effects to the same degree as what we'd get for E, but they're in, of the same flavor, right? So we should see F1 go down a little bit, F2 go up a little bit. That'll push us sort of towards that high <clears throat> front corner of the space, but not quite. So we get a vowel like A rather than E. Yeah. Uh, and then last but not least, we've got this one. So where are the constrictions here? Uh, a little bit of constriction here at the lips and a little bit of a constriction here in the back. Um, it looks fairly similar to the one on top. Maybe this one in the back isn't nearly as constricted as what we got for ooh. Uh, and then definitely not as constricted for the lips as we got for ooh. So sort of the same idea as ooh, but not quite to the same degree in which case you get a vowel like like O or maybe open O in this particular case. It's a little bit ambiguous. But the, these constrictions are also going to lower both of your form and frequencies. Um, I've got some diagrams for this as well, comparing them um, to similar vowels or similar tube shapes. So this is the EA uh, contrast. And you can see kind of the difference in um, constrictions here in the front of the mouth, both uh, in the mid-sagittal view and then the tube view that they constructed. So this one's pretty tight for a long ways. This one just kind of gets tight for a little spot in the middle. Um, or O versus O. Uh, yeah, this one's a little bit tighter here maybe. This one is maybe a little bit further back and definitely less constriction at the lips for O than for O. And I think that's something you can see easily, right? When I produce it on screen or when you produce it for yourself in front of a mirror, ooh versus oh, uh, you don't constrict your lips quite as much for this one. Okay, um, that's basically how that works. I think I might uh, chop this up a little bit and take a break here before moving on to the next step, but that's our basic review of how perturbation theory works. And now we wanna see um, kind of why it matters for language in the next um, portion of this lecture. So I'll pause for now, but I'll see you again in a minute.